Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Linda, and I'm originally from Michigan, now living in the St. Louis metro area. I'm a college coach with School Match for You and have a daughter at University of Chicago. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy has a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia and a master's degree from North Carolina State University. She works in private practice in Raleigh as a mental health therapist. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. Good morning, friends. We've got a lot to cover, a power-packed episode today with a lot of different subject matter to address. Uh, I'll just briefly let you know what we're going to talk about. I'm going to have a wait update. That's right. October is here, and I can't not hold myself accountable to you. I have a FAFSA update. I want to share something a listener sent in following up on the topic of the U.S. News rankings, and I'm going to talk about personal statements. I'm going to talk about um, how to know if you have a good personal statement. And then we'll finally have Lisa's interview with Eric Newbell on the importance of student engagement. But let's talk about the weight update. So technically last Monday was October 2nd, but I was still at my mom's house in Canada without my scales. So otherwise I would have given you the weight update first of the month, but I'm, pleased to say I lost six more pounds this month. So that brings me to a ground total drum roll, please. 15 pounds. And you know, with Lose It, the app, when I put it in, they have all these motivational things. So when I hit that 15 pound mark, confetti started flying around and it said soccer ball popped up. And I was like, what's a soccer ball? And it said, you've lost the equivalent of 15 soccer balls. So it's a start. I still have 65 to go. Uh, but I'm determined and I appreciate all of, of your support. You know, we have such an awesome group of listeners. One thing that inspired me since I last gave you an update is a listener sent a text message to me and said that they got really motivated when they heard my episode about needing to lose 80 pounds and they took the 80 pound challenge themselves and they're down five. So I'm like, we can be 80 pound accountability partners here. Now, I can also say I have gone 68 straight days and entered every morsel that I eat into the Lose It app. That's really the magic for me, the secret sauce, because I'm competitive and I'm determined. Um, but when I don't enter it, I don't lose. Um, but one thing that I, I never shared. So, of course, I've attempted to lose weight multiple times in the past and I've yo-yoed like a lot of people. But you learn yourself. At least you should learn yourself and get better as things pr- progress. And so. One thing I did in the past was I'd set out with a goal, and then as soon as I broke and had one bad day, I would say, you know, I failed, forget it, throw in the towel, I didn't do it. Then I went all the way to the other extreme and said, you know, you got to give yourself some treat days. So what I'll do is I'll stick on my plan Monday through Friday, and I'll let the weekend be a cheat day. Well, I found out that didn't work because... You never, ever lose your yearning for whatever your weakness is. For me, it's potato chips. Someone else, it might be ice cream um, or French fries. You know, anything in the potato chip family gets me. So what I'm doing this time is a hybrid, and I, and I like it. So I've given myself 15 cheat days for the year. So I can enjoy Christmas or Thanksgiving. And I did use one of my cheat days. I only used one out of 68. Day 44, which was September 13th. Uh, the University of Alabama, they treat uh, counselors to really scrumptious meals. And they rented out Maggiano's, a restaurant, and we could get anything we wanted. So, yeah, I had filet mignon and calamari, and I, that was my first cheat day. I thought my mom's 85th, because it was this big, grandiose affair. I'm like, 200 bucks a plate I paid. I'm not going there to nibble on some lettuce. But I actually came in 10 calories under that day. But anyway, enough about the weight. Hopefully, I'm inspiring you. 15 down, 65 to go. 
okay, the FAFSA. There's a lot going on with the FAFSA, and we really need to talk more about it. But, uh, of course, FAFSA, FAFSA's implication is the most significant overhaul the FAFSA's ever had in decades. You're going from over 100 questions down to 38. And the problem is schools still don't know all the details. We don't even know the exact day it's coming out. It's late December. Some people think it might even seep into January. Now we're into New Year. So we'll get more into this later. But I just want to mention five key things that you should know about the new FAFSA. First of all, the current discount for families with more than one child is going away. So in the past, when you looked at an expected family contribution for one child, you had a second child, it was cut in half. That is no longer here. Secondly, eligibility for Pell Grant is going to be much easier for people to qualify for the Pell Grant because what they're doing is they're going to the federal poverty guidelines and they're going to based on household size and adjusted gross income and more people are going to qualify for Pells. Third, federal government will use what's called a student aid index instead of expected family contribution. And I, I'm very supportive of this. Some people say, what's the difference? It's just nomenclature. You know, it is significant because why would you call something an expected family contribution, but it's not what a family can expect to contribute for college? It's the most confusing term ever. It is the government's assessment of a family's income and assets and how much they can afford for college, but very few colleges end up giving you an award that mirrors that need. So I'm personally a proponent of this. I think language is important. So I like this move, student aid index. Fourth thing, the new aid eligibility formula is going to take into account the net worth of a family that has a small business or a family farm. Now, in the past, if you had a small business, 100 employees or less, it was protected from the FAFSA. The CSS profile, which schools with larger endowments oftentimes almost always use, they included business and family farms, but the FAFSA did not. That is changing. And then lastly, um, students that have an adjusted gross income of under 60000 are not going to have to answer a bunch of questions. Their process is going to be really easy. So those are just a couple of the main changes that are coming. And right now, the launch date is projected sometime between December 22nd and January 5th. But nobody knows for sure, and it's kind of freaking out financial aid administrators. So just thought I'd share that with you. Okay. A listener sent in something, and I was really moved by it. So if you heard last week when I talked about the rankings, I mentioned in 2007 how 19 selective leading uh, liberal arts schools decided to break away from the rankings. Well, Chris Sovak from New York, I got to give him a shout out. He went and did his homework and dug up an article about it. He said, I had no idea about this. Dug an article up and sent it to me. And by the way, I don't just put people's names out here without their permission. I did ask if I could share this and share his name. Here are just a few things from that article. So originally, not only were these schools going to not participate in using rankings at all, they were also not going to participate in the reputational survey that U.S. News Award Report does. Everybody's thought that's been bogus for a long time. It's been a big part of their methodology. 20% now, it was even more in 2007. But that's a lot of weight. One in five provosts, deans, presidents rating other schools. And people say, this is ridiculous. I don't know any school but my own. How am I going to rate another school? So they were going to boycott that. And U.S. News, in their arrogance, came out with a really aggressive statement. And it said, when the May statement was released, the top editor of U.S. News threatened to find other educators to replace the presidents for the reputational survey and said that the letter, talking about the letter from the, the groups that were going to break away, is further evidence that some schools don't want to be held accountable. So that just shows you the arrogance of U.S. News. Okay, a couple other points I thought that might be of interest to you. The newsletter said several things. It says that colleges will stop using rankings in any college publications. Here's the quote. Since such lists mislead the public into thinking that the complexities of American higher education can be reduced to one number. 
Thought you might be interested in the 19 schools. Amherst, Bates, Bowdoin, Bryn Mawr, Carleton, Colby, Grinnell, Hamilton, Haverford, Middlebury, Pomona, Swarthmore, Trinity College in Hartford, Vassar, Wellesley, Williams, Colgate, Washington and Lee, and Wesleyan. Here's a quote from Grinnell's president at the time, Russell Osgood. All of us are suspicious of a ranking metric that would try to say that this college is the best, he said. Not only is that approach overly simplistic, but he said he thinks many of the formulas used tend to favor those of us with very large endowments. Adding, I don't think dollars spent is a simple way to effectively measure educational value. Another quote. All of us agree that part of the problem is that some or all of us have been playing up the various rankings, particularly if we do well, Osgood said. So that led to the commitment to stop doing it. All right, I spent a lot of time on this last week, so I don't want to hang here too much longer. Another quote, though. While most educators are deeply skeptical of rankings, many trustees are not. I think these are much more accustomed to the kinds of rankings which are very common on certain corporate settings. Um, the article goes on to talk about why some people refuse to participate. For example, Claremont McKenna did, did not join in the 25. And this is what they said as to their reason. Claremont McKenna College is very committed to a free market and individual choice. Consequently, our signing these types of restrictive letters is not within the spirit of CMC. For-profit publications and rankings are what they are in our free market economy, with open competition enhanced through freedom of speech and expression of ideas. So I just close this with one one thing that U.S. News Award report ranks Green Bay, Wisconsin as the number one place to live. I don't think most people would read that and say, oh, I need to pick up and move to Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's the number one place to live, according to U.S. News. So my question is, if we wouldn't do it there, why do we give these things so much import? You know, why should you outsource what you think is beauty to what you as news thinks is beauty? And with that, I'll end that topic for at least a few months, if not a half a year or so. All right, let's talk about what I, the core of what I want to talk to you guys about today, which is choosing a personal statement. When you're choosing a personal statement, there are a number of things that I think are important that you take into consideration, that you factor in, that you look at. And I want to go over some of those with you today. I kind of want to be able to do this topic justice. Uh, we have a lot of people who um, are do-it-yourselfers. Uh, you don't have anyone really to help you with this process, either for financial reasons or just because you really enjoy it. And you're, you're working, maybe a parent's working with a student. And I want to make sure that uh, we give you some tools to help you go through and process and take a look at what makes for a really good personal statement. What are the key ingredients? Well, I have a number of things that I use to evaluate if, in fact, a personal statement is A plus versus C plus. And so I'm just going to kind of take you a little bit through the rubric. And so the first thing, and it's not necessarily in order, but this is the order that I'm just going to share them with you, is, is it authentic? Is it authentic? You know, if you hear a panel of admission officers and they're asked the question, what advice do you have for students? You can bet the farm somebody's going to say, be authentic. Now, why is that so important? Well, let's take a look at the whole purpose of even having an application is to understand who this person is. And so the first thing is put it through the authenticity meter. And I'm going to close our episode today with one of my favorite quotes. Our regular listeners have heard me share it from Robin Mamlet, former dean of admission at a number of places, including Lawrenceville Boarding School, Sarah Lawrence, Worthmore, and Stanford on this topic, topic of authenticity. Very, very important. Is it authentic? Is it true to who you are? Second thing, does the student feel passion about the topic? Now, I know passion's a trigger word. You can use euphemisms if you prefer energy, excitement, enthusiasm. Once again, Rachel Tour, former Duke admission officer, I think has got one of the best books out here on the college essay. One of the things she says in her book, the essay you want, the essay you, the student, want to write is the one I want to read. In other words, that energy, that electricity comes through. 
in the writing. So ask yourself, is there passion on the topic? Next, this is actually really important, and I think a lot of people make a mistake here and mess up, and that is, is it interesting and unique? Is it interesting and unique? Admission officers are human beings. I like to say to the students I work with, is it more interesting when you watch a movie the first time or the 10th time? Of course, I don't know a whole lot about watching movies, but I do get one in every now and then, enough to make the point. So everybody knows it's easier the first time. I'll share uh, something that uh, an Emory admission officer said. I was in sitting in their file reading process, and um, uh, an essay came up, and they do CBE, committee-based evaluation, so two admission officers read together, having a dialogue and a conversation. And the one admission officer said, this is the sixth time I've seen this topic this week. Guess what? That was not good. That was like, this is the sixth time I've seen this movie this year. So pick something that's interesting and unique, and it's just a lot easier to hold the admission officer's attention because admission officers are human. Fourth, is the AO learning something they would not know about you from other parts of the application? The essay is an opportunity to fill in the gaps to bring out new perspectives. Quite honestly, every single part of the application should be new information that the admission officer doesn't know, now, particularly the writing portions. Every single por you know, writing portion, you want to ask yourself the question, what have I not shared yet that's important about who I am? And fifth, the, the, the thing they learn needs to be significant, okay? We're not talking about whether or not you like green Skittles more than orange Skittles, right? Like the topic can be mundane because the topic is your vehicle. I mean, some of the best essays I've ever read were on mundane topics. A student writing on their bus ride to school every day and everything they learned on a bus. That was one of the better essays I've read. Another one was on a student who was on a, on on a baseball team, but he never really got to play. And he talked about what he learned sitting at the end of the bench about life. That was a great one. Another great essay uh, I read from a student talked about all the things in the top drawer of her of her um, cabinet, her dresser, and um, and the significance of all of them. So the topic is your vehicle. It's what you say in that topic that matters. I remember having a disagreement with a college counselor who came up to me and said, Mark, you're not going to believe this. I've got a student that wants to write about football. I was like, what's wrong with football? And they're like, football? That's so mundane. That doesn't sound sophisticated. And it's not about the topic. Football essays can be amazing. It's what you say about football. Am I learning something that is significant? Next. Does this is really important? Is there a reflection in the essay? So many essays have a great story, and it stops at a great story. The story is important, and I'll say something next about that. But the story is the setup for the reflection. That's where all the power is. What do I mean by reflection? How you grew, how you changed, how your perspective is different how your values are different, how your habits are different. If you heard my interview with Christina Lopez, Dean of Admission at Barnard um, College in New York, she said something which I love how she phrased it. I love essays that let me see the prism through which you see the world. How has the prism through which you see the world changed? That kind of stuff is just gold. That's the reflection piece. Next story, let's talk about that. Very, very important. Show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see. Too much telling, not enough showing. The mind is not an encyclopedia of facts. The mind's a picture gallery. So speak to a person in a way where you're putting images in their mind. Let me go a step further. Be multi-sensory. Let them hear the sounds. Let them smell the smells. Let them see what you see. Speak. Let them feel what you feel. 
okay? Have emotion. Have emotion. It's really important. Really, really injects life into a personal statement. Next thing. Is it inspirational or depressing? This is really important. It's not what you say, it's how you say. Two people could have the same topic and one can make the AO feel depressed. The other feels inspired. It's all in how you say what you say. And people sometimes feel they need to have a trauma story and the admission officer feels beaten down and they're like, I can't read too many more of these. You're going for inspiration, not sympathy. Inspirational or depressing? This is another really important one. Does the content increase the student's likability? All right, inside scoop. Admission officers don't advocate for people they don't like. The most powerful essays create a visceral connection between the reader and the writer. Now, that's not always easy to do. Sometimes it'll depend on who reads your file and who reads your essay and whether they connect or relate to you. But the best essays do create this emotional bond. And people, admission officers, want to advocate and fight for the person on committee that they like. Now, a lot of times they're going to like you because they see the potential impact they feel you could have on their campus. So they love students. They love their school. This is great. Somebody could come in here and really make a difference. And this power, this likability piece, it really, it really, there's really three main ways that I see in the application where it comes across. The most obvious is in the student voice. The most obvious is in the writing. You know, I'll, I'll share something just going back to that event that I attended a few weeks ago with Rice and Emery and Washu Cornell and Pomona. And they were talking about counselor letters. And one of the admission officers said, Counselors, let me give you a hint. The student personal statement is 650 words. Your counselor letter doesn't need to be longer than the student voice. I want the student voice to be the dominant voice. I don't need the counselor letter to be longer than what the student writes. So what are these ways for to create this emotional connection, to have this likability? Well, first of all, you can't fake it. You are who you are. But... There was all of the writing, personal statement, custom questions, all of the writing. It's the most obvious point. Recommendations is the second. Another outside substantiator can absolutely do that by what they say about you. They can definitely increase the connection between the student and the AO. And then the interview. The interview is very powerful if you have an, an interview, especially if it's directly with an admission officer. But even if it's not, the interview write-up from a senior fellow, from an alumni. You know, those are the things, places where I see more so than the quantitative side, the data side. The data side is not really what fires people up. You know, what do I mean by data? Test scores, AP scores, AP scores, um, SAT, ACT scores, curriculum, GPA, weighted GPA, class rank. That's all good. And the less selective the school, the more that stuff matters as far as getting people fired up. But in more selective processes where those numbers are typically high across the board, the numbers don't move the emotions. It's the student voice through the interview, the rec writing, and the interview notes. Okay, next. Does the topic give you the ability to show transparency and vulnerability? This is actually really important and really powerful. Uh, something happens when you as the writer let the admission officer into your world in a way that they feel complimented that you trusted them enough to share something that was a little vulnerable. Now, you certainly can go overboard with that. And there's a place where you can cross a line of either too much vulnerability or, or you know, delving into topics that are just TMI. So, you know, there's a fine line there. But when you can reveal your understanding of yourself, your acceptance of yourself, it can be really, it can be really powerful, this transparency, vulner vulnerability place, or just mistakes that you've made and you're showing courage to own them can be really powerful. Next, does it elevate your value? 
Remember the lesson? Everybody's tuned into radio station WIIFM, and that stands for What's In It For Me? Mission officers are reading it through the perspective of what is this student going to bring to our community? How are they going to add? How are they going to strengthen? Does your essay elevate your value? Very important. And I'll hear a few more now, and I'm likely to come back to this topic again. Is there tension? Is there conflict? Is there suspense? You know, a lot of times in some ways, uh, writing is similar to, to a storyline and a plot that you see in a movie. Holding people's attention, really important. That's why story is so powerful. Showing, not telling, because it's, it's persuasive and it's memorable. But having tension and conflict, it, it's really a nice little piece in, to have as part of the personal statements. And then the last one is, does it showcase your personal qualities in a way that brings them to life? So personal qualities get admission officers really, really excited. Kindness, empathy, generosity. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Courage, adventuresome spirit. You know, uh, stepping outside your, your comfort zone to listen and to learn. I mean, I just go on and on. They're just I'm not going to go over all the personal qualities. We've done that in past episodes. But when an admission officer sees personal qualities that they feel their campus could use more of, they get very excited. And so many of the uh, custom questions that are out there are designed to bring out what personal qualities does this student have and are the ones that we need more of on our campus or ones that we're looking for more on our campus. So there's a dozen for you. I'm going to give some thought about coming back next week and adding some more to this. Uh, I'm still thinking through this, putting my thoughts down in writing, but I'm hoping for you do-it-yourselfers. This will help you assess your personal statements and improve them and make them as good as they possibly can be. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this segment. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, for part three of Lisa's interview with Dr. Newbel, Lisa asks Eric how they handle all of the diversity of opinions on campus. Lisa asks, is it, is it harder today dealing with free speech issues on campus? How can a college assess how well they are doing when it comes to supporting students? Eric answers that question. And Eric talks about what to look for in a private school versus a public college when it comes to examining their long-term viability. Listen and enjoy. In terms of, like, there's been so much that's happened lately in higher education. I, I can barely keep up with the different headlines that pop up every day. But one theme is that, you know, we, there's really diverse needs on campus. There's diverse needs for engagement. There's diversity of opinion. Um, how do you manage that at a big school like ECU? So I'll tell you a story first. That I just happened story. two weeks ago. I'm a storyteller, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> so I'm sitting at the welcome desk because even though I'm in charge of the building, we were down a student. And uh, to be honest, I found that working at the welcome desk is a much easier job than my job because I get immediate satisfaction. Somebody asks where something is, I say there, they say, thank you so much. And I don't get that as much in my office, <laughs> right? So um, I'm sitting at the desk with a couple of students and a parent walks up. And the first words out of his mouth is, so I walked by your LGBTQ center upstairs and it had Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. And I'm, we get to sometimes I'm ready for the political debate that's about to ensue, right? And then he goes, but then I walked by this area that's dedicated to our veterans and our military students. Then I walked by a poll that says prayer and has a QR code and if you, and it's from the University Religious Life Committee that if you want a non-denominational prayer for you, scan the QR code and put in a prayer request. And he looked at me and goes, I'm very confused. Where do you stand? <laughs> and I said, we stand for our community and our community is diverse. It's made up of different opinions, people from all over the word, world, different religious beliefs, right? And we are here to help them 
to harness their beliefs and to just inform their beliefs. I tell people all the time, we do as good a job bringing in a speaker like Tommy Lauren, very conservative speaker, as we do bringing a Dr. Lamont Hill, a very liberal speaker, right? Which we had both those individuals within a month of each other on the campus. And we had packed auditoriums for both of them. And so, and I encourage students to go to these different speakers, particularly if you disagree, because it will help to inform your opinion. And it's not to change, we're not trying to change people's minds. We're not trying to get you to believe what I believe, right? I'm trying to get you to make sure that you're gathering information, just like you would in a research study, just like you do in your class, right? You go to the library, you go to you go to the internet, gather information. And the benefit of being, particularly at a large institution, research institution, is we have so many incredible opportunities to hear speakers that are in the political consciousness, that are in the social consciousness, up close and personal, and even ask them questions. Right? Engage with them, ask them questions. You might find that it might tweak your opinion to move a little bit. It might find that it reinforces the opinion you already had. It might find that you changed your opinion, right? Who knows? But now you have an informed opinion, not just an opinion based on what you think you know by watching videos. Videos are great, right? But we've all gone <laughs> down that algorithm rabbit hole of social media where you watch one video and then you start noticing the next seven videos are all the same type of thing because it it's reading what you like and it wants you to watch it right more, right and so you're not really searching out alternative content at a college it's in front of you all the time and we try to do this concept particularly in our facilities of form versus function it needs to be functional it needs to be pretty it needs to have comfortable seating there needs to be food there needs to be access to stuff directional signs but there needs to be some real form there needs to be some how does this work how does this look how does it feel is it giving you what you want so we decorate we put our creed up on the wall we put our values on the wall we put a prayer pole we put a black lives matter we put a we 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 love the veterans right i have tables that set up where you have pro palestine and pro israel right next to each other Right. And unfortunately, I'm the person who has to mediate between the two when they say that they should not be there and they should not be there. But then I tell <laughs> both of them that this is this is part of the the ideal of America, of free speech. Right. As long as you're not you're not attacking a, a protected class, as long as you're not threatening somebody, you're allowed to have your belief and your opinion and you're allowed to share that with others as you want. And we're going to and we like to say we don't manage freedom of expression here. We celebrate freedom of expression. And so I happen to be, that's one of my alternate titles, the um, Deputy Freedom of free, free Speech Officer for the institution. Every, <laughs> every North Carolina public institution has a free speech officer at oh, their really? institution. And uh, yeah, it's a fun job. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so every protest, march, candlelight vigil, um, whatever it is, right? I'm at those events. I'm helping those students plan those events. And we have two goals, always two goals. Second goal is that your voice is heard that your voice and your opinion is heard. So that means we manage counter protests. We make sure you have the right equipment. We get you in the right locations. We make sure you're thinking about time of day so you're not doing it on a Friday afternoon when nobody's on campus. Number one goal is safety. Number one goal is safety, right? And and we, for the last, um, for in 2019, the Raleigh News and Observer named us one of the uh, top 60 free speech schools in the country. Um, publish an article about that. And so we're, we're proud of that. And that's why we say we celebrate free speech. Um, and, and it's educating sometimes not just our young people, sometimes it's our faculty and staff and our community, but educating them that if you really want free speech, free speech is a right that's granted to everybody, whether you agree with their opinion or don't, right? That's different between laws and policies. We follow laws and policies. We are not the legislature. They make the laws and policies. But for for coming to campus, we are not here to change your mind. We are here to make sure that we celebrate all of you. We give you forums, we give you opportunities, we give you speakers and presentations, and a lot of our student groups in their own different areas, the college Republicans, the college Democrats will bring different speakers on campus. We teach them how to market the event, how to have a safe event, how to draw a bigger crowd to the event for all of those groups. Um, and so often I have students who graduate, um, which I know I've done a good job where they look at me and say, you know, I thought you believed one thing, but then I met with you and then I thought maybe you believe this thing and now I'm just totally confused, much <laughs> like that guy was. See, I'm bringing back around here. Much like oh, that guy it. was. He, I, I want somebody to come, whether it's to me, a staff member, or, or just our campus and say, I don't understand where you stand. And I was like, we stand for you. 
Like we stand to celebrate everything that's part of our society, right? And and that's what's important. And I think that is unfortunately a misnomer sometimes that's that's out there about what institutions are public and private, right? That are doing to try to indoctrinate students. When I'm not saying there's not a a bad person on a campus that might be trying to do that, right? But the mission of the institution and the vast majority of every faculty, staff, and and even student leaders on the campus are not trying to indoctrinate. They're trying to have their voice heard. They're trying to help others hear their voice. And they're trying to make sure we share as many ideas and concepts as possible. So you come out saying, I got a quality education. You know, I made a lot of friends and connections, both in faculty, staff, and students for your future jobs and, and careers. And I feel like my opinions, some of which might change, some of which are exactly the, what they were when I came in, are more informed. I have data, I have strong points. I sat there in a room with Tommy Lauren and heard her speak and say, she's not as bad as I thought she was gonna be. I'm, I'm really impressed. Or, or with a Dr. Lamont Hill and said, wow, he really made some good points even though I don't agree philosophically with him. Mm-hmm. Have you found it to be more difficult in the last few years, you know, as American society in general is more divisive? Has it been harder for you being the deputy officer of free speech? So um, I really do love the job. I mean, it was one of those jobs that, um, you know, when the when the when the call came out from the assembly saying every institution is going to have one, um, it was an obvious choice because I had already been the person I'm over all the engagement activities and, I'm, and I already had a, an interest in and a research interest in the idea around civil discourse was my research interest. Um, actually, what's going to, it might sound strange, it might not, it has become easier with the students, harder with the adults. Huh, interesting. Right, and, also, and, and, and the students are adults too, but, it, you know, harder with sometimes faculty, sometimes community. And some, and a lot of times, parents, right? And and you think about it when you have some seasoning to you, <laughs> you are you are more set in your opinions, right? And sometimes it's hard when we're saying things like we're going to throw a lot all the stuff at the student, they're going to figure it out, and they're going to tear it apart, and they're going to ask questions, and we're going to have these conversations. It's hard for them because I think there's a worry sometimes that their viewpoints are not going to agree with theirs, you know? And so as a parent, that's difficult. Like I, 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 it's difficult now. My son is uh, 13, he's a basketball player, um, right? And he's Jewish. And so when he loves Kyrie Irving and when Kyrie Irving came out with all those issues around being Jewish and, you know, and, and the Jews, he really struggled. Like I was like, I was pretty clear. I, I knew exactly. I was like, dude, get rid of that Jersey. Like we're not wearing the Kyrie Jersey anymore. Right. And he's like, I don't know if I want to do that. Right. And it was hard for me to let him make his own mind up. Right. Because I'm like, what do you mean? You don't want to do that. You live in this house. You, haven't I raised you? Right. <laughs> right. And then even with faculty, it's hard sometimes because faculty get concerned when, if you're let's say a liberal faculty member and you have conservative students and they're great leaders and they're fantastic and they've done great things for the student body but they come out, they almost feel like, well, maybe they should have come out becoming turning liberal. And it's like, no, they're, they're, they can still be conservative. And that's what we try to teach is that Republican, Democrat are parties, right? Liberal and conservative, conservative is, is, on a, is on a plane, right? And you flip back and forth. And I explain that I, I have liberal beliefs and I have conservative beliefs. And there, there, there rarely is just one side. Right. We're living in that middle paradigm where we shift with age, experience, with knowledge. Um, But it's become harder because as that narrative has grown that we're indoctrinating or, you know, that it's um, that certain types of institution are only conservative or only liberal. Right. Um, Like the, the, the misnomer is that public institutions are only liberal and only have liberal thought, which is not totally true. The, it's just the same as number that religious institutions are only conservative. Not totally true. It depends on the culture of the institution and the people you meet at that institution because they're big schools. That it, it's 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 really a paradigm. Where, where does it shift? And I think it's that's where it's become easier because the students have access to more information. You know, pandemic, George Floyd. You know, they've been inundated with information. They're looking for somebody not to tell them what's right and wrong, but just to say it's okay to think that. Like, let's talk about it. Hey, you want me to want me to give you some more resources? Hey, you want to help plan a speaker based on your your you know, they they really enjoy that concept. Um I think it's harder for adults, including myself, when you're in those roles and you're more set in your beliefs to see 
see young people that you still care about and you love that might shift slightly from some of your beliefs, right? And that, that's that's worrisome, whether they get more conservative, more liberal or whatever it is, right? And I think that's that's hard for adults. So it's been harder dealing with faculty, staff, community, parents, um, post-pandemic, but it's actually been easier dealing with the student body. That's so fascinating. Yeah, that makes total sense too. And it, it, like, I love, you know, everything is complicated, right? I mean, that's just, as human beings, we like to flatten things out and split things into good or bad or right or wrong, but it's rarely like that. And I think it's great that the students are starting to really see that too. Um, how can students who are applying to colleges and their parents um, assess a college for how well it does in engaging and supporting students? Now, I know you mentioned um, one thing to look at is freshman year retention. Yep. Are there other things or what would you recommend? I mean, the two big ones from a, from a, from a rate or from a, a data point is going to be freshman year retention and graduation rate. Um, I would tell people, most people like to use a six-year graduation rate. Because if you use a four or five, you're lopping off those kids who take a little bit longer for whatever reason, right? Or have a more, have a double major and it takes longer. Um, so a six-year graduation rate is what you want to look at. Six-year graduation rate and the first-year retention. If they're low, it doesn't mean it's bad. But then now you have talking points when you're looking at that school. Saying, hey, I saw your, your first-year retention rate is in the 50s. Um, what are you doing about that? Like, what do you think that's what's, what's happening? And hear about what they're doing. Um, right, and a good sign is that they they acknowledge it, know it, and have have strategies on what they're going to do to improve that. A bad sign is like I have no clue, <laughs> like well we're trying, you know that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and those are, that's all public information. If you go onto any any university website, and you will you can Google it. You can like I can just Google ECU um, fast facts. Right. And usually it's it's something facts, but it's usually fast facts. You can go on any website for any institution, bigger, large or small, and they publish all their fast facts. And they'll, li they'll list their distribution of students, where they're from, but they'll also list that graduation rate and retention rate. And if they don't, that should be a sign that they're that they're not listing that. Again, not one to pass up, but one to start asking questions to know where you ask those questions. Also, I think it's important the academics is always been more visual, right? Like it's more, always been more apparent. Like, you know, the, the they all institutions do a great job touting their academics, what they do in, with their academic success. There are more and more schools now that are have software out there. We have a new one called Stepping Blocks that actually gets us to see exactly where our alumni, in fact, in our database is currently about 125,000 alumni oh, wow. that will show us exactly on a heat map of the United States, where they're living, what companies they work for, what their majors were, what the skills are required for those jobs, what their five, 10 year average salaries are, right? And you can pick out every single major we have and find that. And you could see that exactly where they're gravitating to in their first five years per so 10, 10 years per everything. How many, how many people are living in, in uh, Texas? Right? How many and what industries in Texas are hiring a lot of our students? So um, those are great things to ask when you start to go through the recruitment cycle. Of do you have some kind of a data point or map of where the students are working, what their average salaries are, and where they're working by different degrees? Um, a lot of schools, not everyone, but a lot of schools will have that. The bigger schools will probably most definitely have that. Small schools might not have that quite yet, right? But that's a good chance if you're really looking at career paths. To remember, the average student will change their major three times, right? Yes. And so you know, and I think that's gone down because when I was in school, we changed our major four or five times was the average, right? <laughs> so that's, we're getting better. Um, but to realize that even though you're looking at a communications major, they might be a business major in a year, right? But but at least gives you an idea of where we're placing students and in what industries, what jobs are hiring, right? To get an idea of when they're coming out. The other piece I think to look at is the quality of the facilities that are non-academic um, or academic support. So academic support, I talk about like tutoring centers, um, labs, if you're a science major, what are the chemistry labs, the biology labs like? Um, if you're an engineering student, what are those labs like? So you know if you're in a degree that's not a liberal arts degree and it's going to have very lab-based curriculum, Try to get a tour through that. The, you can go to that department on, a, on your tour and just look in the lab windows. You don't even need just to get a sense of what, what their labs look like. Then also look at their student life facilities. Um, and it doesn't have to be brand new as much as how are they keeping it up, right? Their student center, residence halls, a recreation center, their health services, very important. You know, is it, is it just a room with a nurse like a high school? Or is it a robust health services that might have a pharmacy? 
attached to it, right? And so I think going to those facilities, even something as simple as look at it on the website, um, and these are things you can do from afar, right? Pull up the images of the of the buildings, um, and then when you get to the campus, walk through those areas. A lot of times people come to ECU and they walk through our student center, which we're lucky because it's brand new, right? They walk mm, through the student center, beautiful. they run to one room in one building that we show because we can't show every room because people are living in them, right? And then they just walk around the outside of the campus and then they might stop by an auditorium to get a tour. Like when you're done with that tour, go to the building that has your major and walk through it, right? Look at the health services. Go look at the rec center if you didn't get a chance to see that. Go look at some of the other places where you know you're going to take advantage of and you'll get a sense of the commitment of that institution for those services. Um, everything will not be brand new. Right. Um, you know, we, we all don't have unlimited resources um, unless you're a, a military academy like the West Point. They seem to have <laughs> un Annapolis West Point, incredible resources from the federal government. But uh, the rest of us don't have unlimited resources, even a wealthy school. So there's going to be certain buildings that are going to be older and, you know, but you'll get a sense of what's going on. So if you're walking through a campus and everything, every residence hall looks like it was built in the 50s and nothing's been upgraded, that's not a good sign. Right. I also tell people, um, you know, when you when you look at a company, you want to look at the financial health of the company, because that's going to tell how they invest in that. But they're also going to see how um, how they've done long term. Look at the financial health of every institution. Some of that means endowment, but endowments can be tricky because public schools don't need as much of an endowment, even though it's great to have one. Right. They generally don't have as large of endowments because they operate off of some state funding. Right. So the endowment is really a good indicator for a private school. For a public school, I think it's it's a better indicator to see its growth. Look at its its enrollment over a five, 10, 15 year cycle, which are pretty easy to pull up when you go to public schools. You look, you go to the system and you can pull up information about those schools and system. You can just Google stuff like what has the enrollment been at ECU over the last 10 years? And you, know, you ask Google almost anything and it will come up. Right. And you can see enrollment trends um, and then taking into account things like COVID. <laughs> right. But <laughs> but you can see enrollment trends. And I think that will talk about the viability of the institution, the long term viability. And so you ask all those type of questions to build a total picture because one answer or one area doesn't give you the full picture. But I think those things are really important when you're looking. And I will tell you, nothing beats. And I know some people still don't do this. People who live in Greenville will not come to visit ECU and just apply and get it. And it's like, well, I, I live by ECU. I know it. Take a tour of that institution. And I particularly love the early summer tours that are like small groups. They walk you around and then you spend the next two hours just exploring the campus on your own. Um, while you explore a campus, get a student newspaper. Doesn't matter whether it comes out once a week or once a month or, or daily. Get the student paper. You will learn about the culture instantly on that campus because students are writing in the student newspaper and they have no filter, right? <laughs> so you will learn everything about that campus. Um, but do those tours. Um, and I think that's so important, particularly if you have downtimes in the summer or even the winter breaks, right? Where you can drive, even if it's a school right in your own backyard, get on the campus, do a tour. And, and we, like a lot of schools, have our own walking tours on campus. Where we'll give you a map, go to points. So even if our admissions office is not available at that time, you know, you can go by the student center. And the main point is always to go into a student center, go to the welcome desk of the student center, and they will have practically all the answers. It's like the modern day switchboard, <laughs> right? Where you didn't know what to do. So you called the operator and the operator told you where to go and what to do and how to, that's what, that's what that main desk of the student center, because they are open the majority of the year, even through the breaks, there'll be somebody at that welcome desk. Um, so you can start there. That's great. Such great advice. Friends, this concludes part three or four of Lisa's interview with Dr. Nubo, student success and engagement and the importance of it. And I hope you'll join us next week for the final part. On Thursday's episode, Susan and Julia join me to discuss the NACAC conference in Baltimore that occurred in late September, a gathering of 7,000 admissions professionals and college counselors of all stripes. And they'll share what workshops they thought were most helpful. Lisa and I will take on a speak pipe question, and we'll be looking at whether it's better to take a course online pass fail or have it count toward your GPA. We'll have the final part of my interview with Ron Lieber, the lead money columnist for the New York Times, and we're talking about tough questions about paying for college. And friends, we're giving our team a break for a week on spotlights. 
is we love doing spotlights, but there are a lot of work and all of us counselors are working here with November deadlines. So we're going to take a little time off on spotlights, but of course we will return to them. And friends, I close you out as promised with a quote. It's one to you, one I've read to you before by Robin Mamlet. And I think it's important because right now there's a lot of conversation about activities. What do I include? What do I not include? And there's a fine line there where you can embellish and sort of exaggerate and make yourself sound a little bit better than you are. Um, But here's Robin Mamlet's quote, and I want you to think about this. Even more than impressive test scores or great transcripts or fantastic essays, colleges are looking for authenticity Not the appearance of authenticity, not the packaging of authenticity, not the strategy of authenticity, just authenticity, plain and simple. So why is that? If they detect exaggeration or pretense or packaging, how do they know which parts of the application are real? See you on Thursday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Motvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Talianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.